Anubam sir, am I audible sir? Yes, yes, you are, you are audible. So we can start sir. Yeah, is... So can I, can I start? Yes sir, 282 participants are already joined sir. Okay, okay, let's start. Okay sir. Just give me one minute. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Now, I welcome all of you to join this lecture of paper one practice and procedure. Now, I don't want this lecture to be a very structured one. And I want to to be very honest, I, as far as the examination is concerned, I want to trust you on your abilities as a lawyer and not somebody who would be very, very parrot-like. I want to test your original application of mind as the paper goes, it's called practice and procedure. So practice and procedure is otherwise a very, very vast paper. It is not only limited to the Supreme Court rules, but to a host of other topics, including, but not limited to the Constitution of India the Advocates Act. This also entails your preparation that you would be doing for your other papers like drafting, professional ethics, and leading cases. Now, I would consider all of us to be very, very fortunate in serving in a great institution like the Supreme Court. Now, again, as I, as I said at the beginning of my lecture, that I do not believe in very, very structured lecture or a very, very structured examination pattern. So, for those of you who have only referred to the past papers are bound to be a little disappointed. But having said that, I will ensure that people with original thinking and people who've actually been practicing in the Supreme Court will not find the question paper to be tough at all. Now, I must, before the my lecture starts, I must also tell you that when you look at the question paper, the question paper may appear to be a little exhaustive, which it is. I must confess that the question paper is a longish question paper. However, when we are evaluating you, we don't, when, you, when we look at your answer, we are not looking for a very, very long answer. So the pattern is, that I should know by just looking at your answer that you know what is asked of you and expected of you. They need not be very, very long answers because the question paper would be in three parts. Part one, part two, and part three. Now, I want you to read the instructions before you attempt your question paper very, very carefully so that you know and understand what is being asked of you. And you would know which questions are compulsory and which questions are optional. So the 10 markers are compulsory questions and the two markers, some of them are optional. Now, what I have done is that I have tried to cover a host of topics so that 
you are presented with something holistic and mind you that i do not expect you to write very very long answers i i at the cost of repetition i am saying this is my is my video uh, there or is there a problem with my video it's there i think there's a problem with you you are visible sir i am visible right thank you so as we've learned pressy writing in school so i want to reemphasize please do not because once you start writing very very exhaustive answers then you will not be able to complete the paper because what happens with all of us is that when you attempt your first answer you want that answer to be very very good and resultantly your other answers are compromised and by the time you reach the end you realize that you've probably missed 10 15 20 percent of the paper now broadly i whatever i speak today you may take the words coming out of my mouth to be you know hints as to which are the topics that you i may want you to cover and it is obvious that the topics that have been given to you i i could not have covered the entire uh, spectrum in just one question paper so i have laid emphasis on the ones that i felt were important for you to know as an advocate on record i'm sure all of you know the history of this examination the concept how it evolved despite the fact that we have an advocates act which permits everyone to practice throughout the country of india including the supreme court yet we have devised this system and the power flows from the constitution of india power of the supreme court to frame its own rules and how there was a challenge laid to the examination itself by miss lily thomas and how her contention was repelled so all of that but let me tell you that i was an advocate on record for about 17 18 years and i think that this is a great institution which has really served the supreme court and there is a lot of accountability that comes with it as far as our supreme court practice is concerned apart from that it also ensures that there is a certain standard that you must possess if you practice in the highest court of the land so let me start by give let's let's get get into the basics of the examination now as you know that the supreme court has a very very wide jurisdiction is is the video stable okay all right so there's probably a problem with the software not with my camera so the first topic that i want to touch upon is the jurisdiction of the supreme court and as lawyers practicing in the supreme court this is the first thing that you must know as to what are what is the jurisdiction of the supreme court and when i say the jurisdiction of the supreme court i obviously want to touch upon the original jurisdiction which you all know are suits preferred in the supreme court now who can file a suit whether it's union state state versus state etc etc so i would want you to know this now the supervisory jurisdiction re review jurisdiction appellate jurisdiction contempt jurisdiction so these are things that i would expect you to know now what is very very important today is that initially the appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court was limited to a few acts 
in fact i have been a critic of the system and i have also written extensively on on the appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court today all of you know that there are more than probably two dozen statutes which provide for an appeal uh, before an appellate forum with a further appeal to the supreme court directly so there's just one layer in between so you have a tribunal under article 323b of the constitution of india with an appellate tribunal and then with an appeal to the supreme court so unfortunately the supreme court has actually become an appellate court for all these tribunals i think more than 24 25 tribunals provide for an appeal in the supreme court so this was never the intention of the constitution makers to make the supreme court into a court of appeal in this fashion and you would recollect in fact i'm sure you would you would probably read in your uh, leading cases paper about l chandra kumar when we had uh, cat and then an appeal to the supreme court so it was finally held that there must be a filter through the high court a division bench of the high court before matters reach the supreme court but that that was for cat now we all know that you know there are so many statutes so that's one so when i talk of the appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court please do not limit your answer to the traditional view i want you to have a modern approach and i want you to point out as to how this appellate jurisdiction is expanded in the present system so this is the answer that i would be looking at if there is a question on this on on the jurisdiction now we also know that the supreme court is the highest court and what is therefore and nobody is infallible so therefore there is a power to review now what is the extent of that power when and how that power is to be exercised what are the prerequisites of the review jurisdiction what happens when after the review jurisdiction if a person a party is still dissatisfied what is the sequitur what is the concept introduced by the supreme court in the case of rupa hora what are the contours of the curative jurisdiction of the supreme court how it came about what are the requirements etc etc so you have to be very very care careful in analyzing the jurisdictions including the review jurisdiction and the curative jurisdiction of the supreme court and if you can give me a couple of uh, examples as to when the curative jurisdiction of the supreme court has been invoked it has been invoked very very sparingly but it has been invoked now we come to the power of the jurisdiction to of the supreme court to punish for contempt of itself now the concept of a civil con contempt versus a criminal contempt so when you discuss on the jurisdiction you have to be very very pointed in your answer now we also talk of the supreme court enlargement of jurisdiction what is the concept of an enlargement of jurisdiction of the supreme court where do we find it is it there in the supreme court rules so all these aspects i would expect out of you coupled with this i would also expect you to know about article 142 when an article 142 a power can be exercised can it be exercised de horse a statute can it be exercised to fill in a void in law 
I would expect you to know, Vishaka, how the Supreme Court decided to step in in the absence of a legislation. Would it tantamount to legislating? Would it breach the Lakshman Rekha between the legislature, the executive and the judiciary? I would also expect you to know if an advocate indulges in an act which amounts to a, a misconduct un, under the Advocates Act and the Bar Council rules, can the Supreme Court punish such a lawyer or the procedure set out under the State Bar Council Act and rules have to be followed with the Bar Council of India being an appellate authority. So all these things I would expect you to know. But having said that, if you have one question which has the width and amplitude of the one that we discussed just now, how would you attempt such a question? Begs an answer. So therefore, what I am looking at is not an exhaustive answer running into 10 pages because then you would be compromising on your other questions. So I would only want to know that you know the contours of the jurisdiction and that you are able to explain succinctly how these jurisdictions are meant to provide succor to a citizen. Now, one very important aspect is the power of the Supreme Court to transfer cases. Now, in our present system, this power is exercised, how this power is supposed to be exercised, does one party have, uh, I don't know how to put it, does it lead in favor of one party? Is it or should it be gender neutral? What is the difference between the power of the Supreme Court to transfer civil matters? What are the contours of this power to be exercised for criminal matters? What is the yardstick? I want you to read the case of the Supreme Court in Janalitha's uh, matter. Why is the power in criminal cases to be exercised sparingly? When I say sparingly, because can it be exercised at the investigation stage? Should it be exercised only for trial cases? What is the nature of power? If such an power, if such a power is exercised, does it show that the Supreme Court has no faith in the judicial system of that particular state? Does it amount to casting aspersions on the capability or otherwise of the investigating agency or the prosecuting agency of that state? What happens? <clears throat> I, I just mentioned Jailalita's case. What happens? If there is a surcharged atmosphere pre prevalent in that sta state, what happens if the accused was or is the chief minister of that state? What is the meaning of 
justice should not only be done, but justice should be seen to be done. So these are things that I would expect you to have in your answer if such a question is asked. Now, compared to this, if the same question carries two mark, marks in the third part, how do you attempt such a question? So therefore, you have to be very, very smart while answering your while answering, whether it's a 10 marks question or a two mark question. So therefore, if you know the concept, you would be able to attempt both. Now I have been emphasizing on one aspect, namely that your preparation, because this is minded, this is your first paper. But your preparation for the other papers would contribute immensely in answering questions for this paper. I can see a few of you raising hands. I, I will take questions, but I just want to give you a broad spectrum of what you should prepare on. Now, I have given you very, very important hints in the opening part of my lecture. And I have also told you that your understanding of the jurisdiction on the civil side and your understanding of the jurisdiction on the criminal side has to be very, very clear. One has to understand that when you are practicing in the highest court, then these lines diminish between criminal law and civil law. You are expected to do both. And therefore, and you are not expected to be a jack of all and master of none. So one has to work tirelessly towards both jurisdictions, especially when you are an advocate on the court. If a client comes to you, you can't say, sorry, I only do civil side and I can't take, take up a criminal matter. Now, the second part of my lecture, therefore, focuses on the Supreme Court's power and the Supreme Court's enlargement of criminal jurisdiction, criminal appellate jurisdiction. How is this power to be exercised? When is this power to be exercised? What is the nature of power when it's a case of a reversal of decision? What happens in a case when an accused is acquitted by the trial court? And that decision is reversed and the accused is convicted by the High Court. Would the Supreme Court then be obligated in law to exercise its jurisdiction? What happens in the reverse if the trial court convicts an accused and the High Court acquits the accused? Would the power still be exercised in the same manner as if this would this was an enlargement of criminal appellate jurisdiction are concepts that I expect you to know. Now I am laying very, very special emphasis on the power of the Supreme Court to as far as the contempt jurisdiction is concerned and your understanding of what is a civil contempt and what is a, a criminal contempt, the procedure for both, are there any rules to regulate proceedings for contempt 
or are they born out from precedents and judgments? Now, these are broadly the, sub, the topics that I expect you to know. Just let me see. Now, I obviously expect you to know when you when we are discussing jurisdiction as to what is a discretionary jurisdiction under Article 136. What is a reference jurisdiction? Can the Supreme Court say no to a reference? Now, when I when I say all this, I expect you to know the precedence. When has the Supreme Court said no to a reference, reference jurisdiction? If I ask you what is a reference jurisdiction and if you just tell me article so and so is the reference jurisdiction, this is how a reference is sent to the Supreme Court, this is how a reference is answered, a reference is not binding and then, but if you additionally give me that there was a reference of 1998, reference one of 1998, which was answered and before that reference was answered, there was a there was a concession gave by the attorney given by the attorney general that this reference the executive would consider as binding, and that's how the judge's case came about, the second one. If you are just if you just give me these three lines, trust me, you'll get ten on ten. So this is something additional that we are looking at that you have not just uh, you know memorized the provision in the constitution but you also know how the supreme court had reacted to a particular reference which all of us as lawyers must know despite the fact that a reference may not have a binding nature yet in that particular case the attorney general before the reference was answered gave this concession so I would also expect you to know the reference jurisdiction. One more very, very important aspect is that we loosely talk of the writ, writ jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and the writ jurisdiction of the High Court. And you, I, I'm sure uh, when we talk of both the jurisdictions, we ought to know the difference between both the jurisdictions where one is for enforcing fundamental rights, the other is for enforcing fundamental as well as legal rights, etc, etc. Now, when these, why additionally, again, this is something which is just parrot-like, anybody would say this. If you tell me, as an examiner, if I get an answer sheet which says, well, 1965 3 SCR, Dwarkanath versus ITO, the Supreme Court had the occasion to examine Article 226. And as to why Article 226 is couched in such a wide manner where it obligates a constitutional court like the High Court to thanks, thanks, Krishan. to reach injustice wherever it is found. So then this is something that you've given me extra. And this just one small thing would definitely fetch you extra marks. It is Dwarka Nath versus ITO, 1965, 3 SCR. I don't remember the page number. Now, Article 142, obviously, we've all, all discussed. And I'm sure Article 141, all of you would know the binding nature of the judgment of the Supreme Court. So, 
रिव्यू वीव ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड क्यूरेटिव वीव डिस्कस्ड ट्रांसफर वीव डिस्कस्ड नाउ आई ऑल्सो वॉन्ट यू टू प्लीज रीड वेरियस कॉन्सेप्ट इन अ जजमेंट नेमली यू वुड हैव रेड स्टेरे डिसाइसिस now long standing judgments are ought not to be tinkered with unless the judgment is absolutely wrong so if there is a long standing judgment which has been followed in various subsequent judgments it must be given the respect that it it, it deserves however stare decisis is not an absolute principle if there is a wrong judgment it can always be overturned maybe 25 years down the line now in a judgment i expect you to know what is a ratio decidendi what is meant by sub silentio what is the concept of an obiter an obiter dicta is an obiter binding on the high court is an obiter of the supreme court binding of the on the high court i just want you to know these concepts and trust me these concepts in your career as an advocate not for the purposes of just passing this exam and if you if i know that you understand these concepts again you need not write a thesis on this but one case law on this which shows there is if i am not wrong if my memory serves me right i believe golaknath says that even an obiter of the supreme court is binding on the high courts so i mean i i may have my personal reservation as far as these things are concerned but having said that i expect you to know this and when i say golaknath you would have read all sankari prasad kesh golaknath keshwaran bharti minerva mills sanjeev kok i expect all of you to to read the, these judgments which you would otherwise never read in your entire career as a as a lawyer and this would make you a much better lawyer so it is not that you are preparing for your leading cases you are honing your skills as a lawyer i know that uh, <laughs> this is like putting a lot of pressure on yourself but uh, trust me i would not have read all these judgments but for this exam so this is equipping yourself to be a better lawyer and honing your skills to be a better lawyer now as far as the part 3 questions are concerned i would be giving you options so two mark questions would be optional so it goes without saying if you get it right you get it 100% right if you get it wrong you lose 100% so for a two marker you have to just tell me that you know the answer so if i have asked you for a particular source of power for a two marker you need not give me 10 powers if you give me three or four that's good enough so you have to be very very surgical in your answer excuse me and it may not be very very exhaustive now there would be technical questions here i expect you to know the supreme court rules 
when I say I expect you to know the Supreme Court rules, there are two ways of looking at it. One is that you have a parrot-like attempt and you just memorize everything. And the second is that you have dealt with it at a personal level, be it interacting with your clients, be it filing in the Supreme Court registry and the registry raising certain objections, you having had the benefit of curing those defects, etc., etc. So one is on the technical side where I expect you to know the Supreme Court rules and the other is on the practical side. I would be asking you practical questions which uh, deserve a practical answer. So trust me, if you've not practiced in the Supreme Court ever, then you may have a little difficulty in attempting these questions. So these are, as I told you, I mean, I, this is the, the maximum hint that I can give you. And I'm sure that uh, all of us have learned something during the, the COVID times. And obviously, I would expect you to know the basics of e-filing, etc. So that's that's the hint that I can give you. Now I also expect you to know uh, the concepts of all of us keep taking chances before the Supreme Court if there's an order passed by the Supreme Court which affects a particular person who was not a party to the list. What can that party do? What is the correct procedure? Does it apply for modification of the order of the judgment? Does it apply for review with permission to file a review? Etc. Etc. So I would expect you to know uh, these answers, which is again apart from being there like concepts like modification, etc., you may not find in the Supreme Court rules. So these are practical questions that I, I would like to ask you. Now, procedural aspect, again, two marks, contempt, etc. So please uh, read through. Now, Civil and criminal, I've already. Now, all the, the various writs, I would want you to know the concepts of a mandamus, a certiorari, a writ of prohibition, etc. So, I, I would want you to know the concepts, quo warranto. Now, for, for some of you who do arbitration matters, I would want you to know the basic concept as to when a person can approach the Supreme Court for appointment of an arbitrator directly to the Supreme Court. What are the grounds to resist the appointment of an arbitrator? So broadly, I would uh, expect you to know. Now, obviously, uh, all of us know that uh, you are expected to know the powers of a registrar what are the, and the powers of a chamber judge. When are matters listed for the chamber judge? What are the powers? When are matters listed for the registrar? What are the powers? So broadly, you are expected to know this. And uh, very Broadly, I would expect you to know, again, I mean, I don't want to be too uh, technical on this, but very, very broadly, the court fee applicable for, for some of the matters. Right. So I think uh, public interest litigation broadly should know. 
and you should also know the concept of locus locus standi in a public interest litigation what are the rules governing pils in the supreme court so i think that's about it i think i've covered everything i don't expect you to know about the checklist and etc etc okay because ultimately these are matters that i don't expect you to please please don't waste your time with all that and don't waste your time on memorizing the the certificates and and the <laughs> affidavits etc please don't waste your time with all that so now now i can take questions no no uh somebody should i take it from the chat box first should i i think that will be proper because people who have been writing i'll just uh, i'll just let me see so first 20 messages are all good evening sir right i hope my audio and video is stable now both are clear sir right right thank you Uh, just see curative uh, advocate ritu rajkumari so uh, ritu curative is something that all of us must know about and this was obviously not there in the either in the constitution or in the supreme court rules and we know that rupa hora case is something see the concept is that no one is infallible even the highest court in the land at times may commit a mistake so therefore we have a very very strict procedure for a curative petition and where a senior advocate has to give that he has examined the judgment himself and that he ha- he feels that justice is not done because of a b c or there is something which is contrary to law so therefore this concept we must understand now dominus lightus yeah so uh from svs to everyone who is svs okay so the concept of dominus lightus i have a right to institute my own matter i have a right to choose my own forum and i have a right to choose my own remedy right but when we talk of a transfer petition the concept of dominus litis in such a case will not apply and why because the supreme court has a power to transfer and this is not just normal inconvenience to a party but the fact that a party who is entitled to seek redress in access to justice is denied to that party so in most of the cases where there's a lady with a small child who is residing 1000 kilometers away etc so in such cases the power to transfer is exercised by the supreme court now uh sir please explain article 142 mr ramesh so ramesh article 142 is very difficult to explain this is like anything under the sun but the impetus is that 142 is exercised to do complete justice between the parties and the supreme court exercises this power very very sparingly however this power is exercised when if there is a void in law or there is a case which has very very peculiar facts so it is only in such cases that the power is exercised in the 142 vishakha we know that there was a there was a void in law subsequently the uh, protection of w- women against uh, sexual harassment etc this act was has been designed on on the guidelines laid by the supreme court in the case of vishakha now uh 
advocate Ashwin Mishra kindly re repeat the concept. I don't know. Uh, Golaknath was on field for 17 years. Yeah, you are right. Okay, now, sir, this is from Geet Ranjan Ahuja. Sir, can you throw some light on the Supreme Court rules for the benefit of those who've been associated with seniors' office and haven't been personally engaged with filing except their own matters? See, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something that I do not want you to have clerical knowledge. If you have clerical knowledge, that's great. If you filed matters personally with the, uh, you know, actually being physically with your clerk, that's the best thing that, you know, you, you could do before you uh, embark on the journey of becoming an advocate on record. But I want answers which are logical, even if you've not done filing personally yourself, you must know this even if you've read the book, the Supreme Court rules. I'm sure you would know, know this. And in any case, when I'm asking the two marks questions, I would have given you enough options. So if you don't know one, you would know the other. So please don't think uh, that uh, I am, I have been a stickler as far as these things are concerned. You will have enough options. Uh, powers of registrar, chamber judge can come for 10 marks. <laughs> this is a leading question. So this I can't, I can't divulge to you. Uh, now, will there be 20 mark questions? I don't know. Uh, this also, I don't know if I can divulge to you. So this will not be fair on my part. But I mean, just apply your mind if if you if you are asked a 20 marks question, that's 20% of, of the entire paper. So you can just think for yourself. Now you're asking me the difference between intervention and impediment. So I have to ask you this, but now that you've asked me, so I passed my AOR exam many, many years ago. But uh, see, th these are things that you must know as a lawyer, right? If you've read CPC, please read CPC. What is the difference between a necessary party and a proper party, right? So when you are impeded, you are impeded as a party. When you intervene, if some of your rights could be possibly uh, affected, and therefore, the court gives you that opportunity to come and address the court. So you don't become a party. So a non-party is allowed intervention. So please, uh, and I would, I would request you to also go and read CPC on the aspect of necessary and proper party, right? So I have practiced on the original side, so my CPC is pretty decent. So order one, rule 10, etc., will give you the answer. Now, uh, now, Mr. Som Sundaram, is the procedural aspect like clerical questions important? No, no. Clerical questions are not important. 20, will there be 20 mark questions? I have, I have again given you enough hint. Uh, arbitration matter in brief, can you explain? See, you just have to know two things broadly. I mean, I am not uh, giving you any other. When does the Supreme Court exercise its power to appoint an arbitrator? Otherwise, all of you know that you have to file an 11-6 application before the High Court if the other party resists appointment of an arbitrator and the high court in terms of your arbitration clause then appoints an arbitrator. When can you approach the Supreme Court directly is something that you have to read up. Okay, what happens if there's a foreign party? So please read up and uh, what are the grounds to resist appointment of an arbitrator? 
I'm sure all of you know that there's an amendment in the Arbitration Act, which will straight away answer this question. Right? Now, while dealing with the difference between 226 and 32, should we also refer to Article 1? No, 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 not required. When you when you are dealing with the difference between 226 and 32, please stick to only 226 and 32 and not to 139, which is a completely different jurisdiction. Now, Sujata, Article 136 jurisdiction regarding water disputes, yes, very, very uh, well. You must, apart from suits, uh, would most of the questions in part three be out of the SC rules? No, part three would mostly be Supreme Court rules, right? It will not be outside the Supreme Court rules. In fact, part one and part two would be more of application of mind and part three would be either from the Supreme Court rules or I may give you a question where I want you to apply your mind and to tell me as to what the answer should be. So it will all be within the Supreme Court rules, but I would expect you to have some application of mind. Intervention, impediment, I've already given you. Yeah, we lost you at the SC and HC and SC jurisdiction under writ and the reference. See, Dwarkanath, Dwarkanath versus ITO, as I told you, 1965 3 SCR. Please read this judgment. This deals with the aspect that the High Court has very, very vast jurisdiction under Article 226. And therefore, 226 is couched in such a wide language that the High Court under 226 is vested with powers where it could actually reach injustice wherever it is found. This is the, this is not my language, this is the language uh, in that judgment. I don't remember the paragraph number of the judgment, but this is the language used in the, why it is couched in such a wide language. Now, concept of amicus curie, friend of the court, all of you know, is not holding a brief for either side, is supposed to give a, uh, a legally sound view according to it and therefore it's called the friend of the court. What is the legal remedy if a judgment uh, of a Supreme Court affects a party who was not a part of the list over the Supreme Court? So this is exactly what we had discussed that a judgment would normally bind parties only. However, we've seen in many cases there is a judgment which almost becomes like a judgment in REM and not a judgment in personam, like the judgment of the Supreme Court in the case of, for example, Orissa Lift, where uh, Justice Goel and Justice Lalit's judgment, if I'm not mistaken, that was the. So where the Supreme Court said that for a technical course, you could not have had, uh, you should have had physical classes and practical classes so people who were not parties before the Supreme Court and people who had long passed their examination, they had to actually take their exams once again. There was an examination conducted, a special examination conducted, and they had to take part in that examination because their courses fell within the definition of a technical. So all, all those people, affected people, were not parties before the Supreme Court. But Supreme Court was extremely magnanimous in permitting whoever came for the Supreme Court, Supreme Court heard everybody, Supreme Court heard people in a representative capacity, ruled in their favor or against them. So all applications for modifications in that case was considered by the Supreme Court. In a case where there could be a, a matter where a third party is affected, in a judgment in personam, if a third party is affected, which is not a party before the Supreme Court, in such a case, that party has a right to file a review with permission to file a review because it was not heard for whatever reasons. 
Now, Anshul Gupta. Okay, so Anshul, you want me to uh, see these concepts are stere decisis, ratio decidenti, obiter dicta, sub silentio. Right? Now, election petition. Don't lay too much stress on election petition. Uh, HC jurisdiction. How many options would be given in 10 marks question? See, this uh, I really can't uh, reveal, but not too many options would be there. This is what I can tell you. There could be all mandatory questions, 10 marks all questions. So please read the instructions carefully before you attempt your paper. So 10 markers could be all mandatory. Okay. Case law Rupa Hura. Rupa Hura is good enough. Niranjan Sahu. Now Vinay Kumar. PIL in detail. I don't think that I need to uh, these concepts have I have told you again stere decisis again stere decisis question see stere decisis obiter dicta sub silentio ratio decide ND modification or review again I have told you clearly. Please also read uh, Urissa Lif, Justice Lalit's judgment. Can we answer those questions first, which we know very well and answer accordingly? Shrey Dhambre. Uh, see, Shrey, uh, I, if you proceed in a chronological manner, it's always better for the examiners. Then it's easier to mark you. Otherwise, it's diff a little difficult that you uh, answer question three first and then question five. I mean, that's how I would uh, want you to answer. But I would not hold it against you if you've done it in a particular manner, because I would read all your answers. Now, practical questions. Can we give our personal experience regarding a particular man. See, uh, I would not expect you to give your personal uh, experience for the reason that these questions would have a legal answer. So that will not be required. Judgment on contempt. Yes, if you can, if you can give me one judgment, one good judgment on contempt, I don't mind. See, if you can give just, I do not expect you to give the entire citation like I gave you Dwarkanath versus ITO because I remember 65 3 SCR. I don't remember the page number. If I have to uh, talk of merger of judgments, etc., then we talk of Kunia Ahmed, right? Justice Lauti's famous judgment. So I can tell you that's 2000 volume 6 SCC. I don't remember the page number, but I remember the citation still. If I have to give you Vinod Kapoor, right? It's something Justice A.K. Patnaik's judgment, 2012-12 SCC, where uh, when you have lost before the Supreme Court and you decide to withdraw and go before the High Court, you don't have a specific permission to come back, what do you do? Then referred to in Kode, distillery, three judges, upheld, which upheld Vinod Kapoor. So broadly, we remember the citation. I don't expect you to give the exact citation. Even if you give me 2012, that's good enough for me. If you can give me the entire citation, well, then that's hats off to you. I would not be able to do it. Sir, please throw Mr. P. Som Sundaram. More light on two marks, please. What type of questions like in procedure? See, two marks will be basically easy questions. So, and, and plus you, you would have a lot of options. So if you don't know a particular question, then you, you will have many options. 
so don't bother okay don't don't stress a remedy for a third party who is affected by the judgment miss lakshmi so we've just discussed that then are cases to cite along with types of jurisdictions when asked only just the different jurisdiction see uh kunal i if you are asked a very very broad exhaustive questions like if i ask you please give me all types of jurisdictions of the supreme court so this is a very very expansive question so obviously i would not expect you to give me judgments and citations for every jurisdiction that would be impossible then i would expect you to only tell me that you know the various jurisdictions and this is the broad these are the broad contours of that jurisdiction that's it nothing more optional questions of 10 marks uh you are being very very optimistic about optional questions of 10 marks uh in court now intervention impeachment we've done it now somebody wants to check my uh, my knowledge because the question is mr abhishek mishra sir your views on ngt being the sole authority on facts in original applications and appeal being available only on the principles of section 100 cpc before the supreme court vis a vis a company law in ibc i mean it's a very very intelligent question and uh, i totally agree with you that there must be at least one level of filter as far as ngt is concerned if it acts an, as an original co court with the uh, original court on fact especially then and only on the principles of uh, section 100 cpc one could understand still section 96 cpc i totally agree with you that with such an appeal to the supreme court there must be at least one level of filter as in most of the other tribunals because a tribunal is constituted under article 323 of the constitution of india and most of the tribunals have one level of filter cat did not have so therefore in l chandra kumar they said that you come via the division bench of the high court so i i totally agree with you that ngt must have one level of filter before it comes to the supreme court and not just in ibc etc i as i told you there are more than 24 statutes which have one level of filter appellate tribunal and then the supreme court all these tribunals are created under article 323b of the constitution of india don't stress too much on election petitions okay uh 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 will there be questions like how many paper books to be submitted <laughs> no don't don't stress yourself with all all that sir you told that there will be three parts how marks will be distributed in three parts why can marks not be distributed in three parts i ask you a cross question no it is no i can't tell him see basically it could be 40 40 20 it could be 30 30 40 so it makes makes really no difference but for two marks questions you will have enough options so don't no stress on that now harsh i think uh, if a question comes on original jurisdiction do we explain article 131 132 along with all types of writs article uh, 71 contempt transfer see you will have to first i hope that uh, you are reading uh you have some very good books on the uh, jurisdictions etc mr venkat ramani ramani our learned attorney general's book is there then you have b r agarwala then you have so i think if you just go through 
these three books uh, th these would cover a lot of things that I have just said. Is it necessary to write order number? What if answer is correct, but order is wrongly mentioned in the answer sheet? See, uh, Rahul, you will have to understand that there's a lot of work pressure that all of us have. So we have to, if you write the wrong question number or answer number, then it will be impossible for, uh, for us to evaluate you. you know, how do we evaluate if uh, you answered question four in answer number three? Impossible. Obviously, you lose marks. Is e-filing procedure we need to study briefly or elaborately? Read briefly, that's good enough. Uh, Now, drafting prayer questions. No, there'll no, there'll not be any drafting prayer questions. AOR certificate is compulsory while filing review petition by advocates. So this, obviously, I would expect you to know. Are we expected to mention SVR? All the powers of registrar and chamber judge? No, please uh, see, it will depend on the marks allocated to a question. If it is 10 marks, obviously, I would expect you to write uh, probably five, six, seven powers. If it is two marks, then I think you've got the answer. In each part, how many questions mandatory for answering? See, please read the instructions carefully. The instructions are very, very categorical and you will have no problem in understanding whatsoever. In case of any problem, I will be available on my mobile to answer any of your queries. But please take it from me that these would be absolutely crystal clear. Sir, can a caveat petition be filed in a criminal case? Of course, it can be. See, we are not guided CPC in the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, you find CPC is 148A in uh, in civil matters in, in, in the... If the such a missile under the government of India, New Delhi has sent the commission in this one of civil petition. The details of cases pending for various levels of judiciary, which are older than two decades or more. Just just one second. I think there's a cross correction. Time duration for resolution of cases the steps taken by government. In the above mentioned company, it has been requested to try in there's a to the above mentioned question to them at the obvious very Mr. Host. Mr. Computer said. Mr. Host, there's a cross connection. Yeah, I, I think we are fine now. Mr. Computer sir has informed flag A that as per data retrieved from Mr. the Mr. Host. The number it's of different. pending matters in Supreme Court of India 16 and the number of matters pending for. More I, than I think I'll have to call up the post. It's a very big essential. Please give me one minute. I'll just. Network. Okay, now switch to. Now. I've got so many questions. I think I'm out of time now. Uh, discretionary jurisdiction, etc. Should we read and prepare drafts for this paper? No, not required. Now, uh, Anand, can we cite cases to embellish our answer? Absolutely. Only with cost title, not citation. Yeah, yeah. If you just give the year, that's good Good for me. Unless you start creating citations, then I'll get to know immediately. Question of law, substantial question of law, yes. Drafting necessary, no, drafting is not necessary. Uh, 
remembering particular rule of the sc rules or is it good to know the uh, ankita it's good to know the principle i am i am good should we know thoroughly about all the five writs yes as a lawyer you must know all the five writs Could you please explain modification, review, and recall? So this, I think, I've already explained to you. Recall is something that uh, normally we don't file in the Supreme Court. Uh, now, Ankita, recusal of judges plus indoor development. So I, I have a very, very strong view about indoor development. And uh, I, I believe most of us have. So, does handwriting really matter? Of course, it does. Presentation is something which is very, very important. If I am not able to read what you've written, how will I give you marks? So, it need not be very good. Even I have a very average. It must be legible and readable. Sir, we have understood that there are 10 marks and two marks questions. Tell us about the third one if possible. <laughs> so that's again, you'll be good in cross-examination because that's how you lead a witness. Can questions come out of practice directions? No, not really. Does it make a difference if review petition was filed in HC before dismissal of SLP? Of course, there is. I gave you the citation Punya Ahmed versus State of Kerala or State of Kerala versus Punya Ahmed, 2000 volume 6 SEC. Please read it. You'll get all the answers there. What was the third book? Uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani is our learned attorney uh, general's book on Supreme Court practice and procedure. Then B.R. Agarwala is very good. Third book is the Supreme Court rules. There's a handbook on practice and procedure also, which is a very exhaustive book. Sir, can we have our number, please? Which number? Yeah. So therefore, I think we've extensively covered all the topics. So all the best, all of you. And uh, as I said, now my uh, closing remarks are, do not stress yourself too much. Okay, be as clear and legible as possible. I do not want very, very long answers. And if you can give me, especially for major cases, one judgment, one good judgment on the topic that's good enough for me. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you, sir. All the best. All of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, you are more than